G'day, g'day YouTube. Nekarakana Sexual Lie here. And tonight, I'll be reading Strange Unsolved Mysteries by Margaret Ronan. This is the first in what I hope to be a long running series entitled Necro Reads. Now the whole purpose of this particular video is that it's going to be the start of what I'm going to call Necroween 2018, which is just a Halloween special running through the month of October. And I'll be starting with this book, which is a collection of urban legends and paranormal stories dating back to 1974, when the book was published. Before we get started, I'll just read the foreword written by the author, which goes as follows. Ghosts, premonitions, dreams that come true, hope, hexes and curses, objects that move by some secret force, places where Mother Nature fools you, all these things can be found in this book and more. Everything you read here really happened to real people. They are true unsolved mysteries that have been witnessed and authenticated. How can such things be? Trained investigators called parapsychologists are working now in university laboratories to try and find out. Some of these investigators suggest that many of these inexplicable events might be explained with three letters, ESP. ESP stands for Extrasensory Perception. With sensory perception, we perceive with our five known senses. Sight, hearing, taste, touch and smell. But extrasensory perception seems to enable people to perceive through thus far unknown senses of the mind. To these parapsychologists, there are four types of ESP. Clairvoyance, which is the ability to know what is happening at a distant area at the time it is happening. Precognition, which is the ability to know what is going to happen before it happens. Telepathy, which is the ability to read people's minds or speak to them mentally. And psychokinesis, often mislabeled as telekinesis, which is the ability to move objects by force of will without touching them. If you like your mysteries to have solutions, you may enjoy deciding what kind of ESP might be the answer to some of the enigmas in this book. A clairvoyant, for example, might be able to read a sealed letter while blindfolded. A touch of precognition might give you hunches that work out. Someone who didn't know he or she had the gift of psychokinesis might set off so-called poltergeist activities. If on the other hand, you prefer your mysteries to stay unsolved, you can take comfort in the fact that many scientists say there is no such thing as ESP. They claim that tests made by parapsychologists in laboratories are not reliable. And other scientists say that if ESP proves to be real, we will have to write a whole new set of physical laws, that it would require new such laws to explain many of the mysteries in this book. Now, I'm only going to read the first two entries in this book, at the time of recording, it is the 2nd of October, and I hope to release a new chapter on every second day, so on the 4th, 6th, 8th, 10th, and so on, with three chapters each, until I'm finally finished with the book, at which point I'll be able to move on to something else. I do have another book of ghost stories, which might be interesting to read as time goes by. And in between recording episodes of Necro Reads Strange and Solved Mysteries, I'll be able to work on a few other projects, including two particularly massive ones which I hope to have released by the end of this month. However, because I do actually work part-time, I'm going to have trouble finding that time because there is a cultural festival going on in my hometown midway through the month. And so, yeah that's going to cause a bit of time strain. Not to mention I'm going to be involved in a Dungeons and Dragons game later this month as well, and so I won't be able to find time then either. But hopefully I'll be able to pre-record several episodes at a time and then release them at the scheduled dates. But anyway, enough of that aside, let's move on to the first chapter of Strange Unsolved Mysteries. Batman and Robin and ESP. 
they leap from tall building to tall building. They scramble over roofs and drop through skylights in pursuit of lawbreakers. No wonder criminals and reporters alike call Dave Greenberg and Bob Hans Batman and Robin. Greenberg and Hans are two New York detectives who work as a team. In four years of togetherness, they have racked up a super record of 600 felony arrests and a conviction rate of 93%. In the course of their duties, Dave have saved Bob's life three times and Bob has saved Dave's life twice. How do they do it? Blame all on ESP, says Dave Batman Greenberg. According to Greenberg, the ESP began when he and Hans graduated from the police academy and were assigned to the traffic unit. We discovered that we had the ability to look at a car and somehow know whether or not it was stolen. We will be on our way to work and bingo, we will get that weird feeling and by the time we checked in the work, we had already made a few stolen car arrests. Dave and Bob were promoted to the rank of detective together and were commended by the police commissioner for their imagination, effort and bravery. Using their ESP, they teamed up in a spree of crime busting. Often without speaking a word, says Bob, we'll both know at the same time that something wrong is going on that we'd better look into. We don't have to tell each other who to go after. It's like having two minds and it's like having one mind and two bodies. Dave agrees. If I get into a bad corner, he says, Bob knows even if he isn't near. He has an uncanny ability to find me when I need him, no matter where I am. To put this to the test, Greenberg once invited a reporter to, to create his own test. This involved Bob going to a telephone booth, followed by, a, followed by the reporter taking Greenberg several blocks away to hide him. The reporter really tried to get lost with me, said Dave, but he didn't have a chance. I concentrated. Bob concentrated, and then Bob found me in less than 10 minutes. This mental hookup with his partner gives Dave extra confidence. As long as Bob's on my side, he says, I'm alright. Once I was in a car with drug pushers, and I was trying to convince them I was, a look I was a crooked cop looking for a bribe. However, they found my hidden tape recorder and they were going to kill me. One had a knife at my throat, the other had a gun stuck in the pit of my stomach. Then in my mind I heard Bob say, hang on, I'm on my way. A few minutes later he drove up, yanked open the car doors and dragged those two guys out. He didn't know where I was, but he found me. How does Hans' building direction finder work? Concentration, he says. You have to empty your mind and make it blank. Then you concentrate hard on the person you're trying to reach. You can't let anything distract you. One morning... Bob Hans felt that he had to call Greenberg at his home. When Greenberg answered, Hans said, Are you okay? I got a weird feeling something was wrong. Thank God you did, he heard Greenberg say. There are five guys hiding outside my yard waiting to get me. Come on the double. Bob and a squad car screamed to the rescue. Thanks to the super cops, a book and a movie made about them, Greenberg and Hans are now famous, but they are more interested in their job as detectives than being celebrities. The big problem is that thanks to the super cops, their identity is now known to too many people and their lives are in even greater danger. But why should we worry? asked Greenberg. As long as Bob and I are tuned into each other, I like colds. Bob agrees. If I should ever fail Dave, the psychic relationship between us will be broken and I do not intend to fail. That is the end of the first chapter, Batman and Robin and ESP. Now. We shall move on to the second chapter, entitled Yellow Blob of Texas. <clears throat> when spring 1973 rolled around in Garland, Texas, Mrs. Marie Harris expected to find flowers blooming in her backyard, but what she found there drove to fall flowers right out of her mind. It was about as big as a plate at first, and pale yellow, she said. It looked sort of foamy and creamy. That is how Mrs. Gal. That is how Mrs. Harris described her unexpected backyard visitor, the blob, to reporters. 
How it got into her yard, no one knew. But there was one thing for certain, she didn't want it there. She didn't know what it was or where it came from, but she was determined to get rid of it. Mrs. Harris armed herself with weed killer and sprayed the blob. It shuddered and began to pulsate. Then she got a hoe and gave it a few whacks. The blob bled red and purple fluids, but it stayed put. For several days, Mrs. Harris waged war against it. She tried to set fire to it, but it wouldn't burn. She attacked it with a lawnmower, but it just seemed to flatten out a little. And all the time, it was growing. Within three weeks, it doubled in size and changed its colour slightly. It was now yellow on the outside, but orange on the inside. Firemen and police inspected the blob, shook their heads, and walked away. Neighbours and reporters stopped by to examine it. So did Dr. C.J. Alexopoulos, a biologist from the University of Texas. He snipped off a bit of the blob and took it away to examine. Meanwhile, the Texas sun blazed away and the blob began to turn brown around the edges. Mrs. Harris thought that the sun might have been wilting it, as the blob did not look as robust as it once was. She decided to attack it once more, this time using a spray containing nicotine. Upon using it, the blob pulsated madly, then shriveled up and died. A report came back from the University of Texas, and Dr. Alexopoulos thought that the blob might have been a kind of fungus, but he couldn't say what kind. For a fungus that pulsated when attacked and bled red and purple fluids was unfamiliar to him. If that thing was a fungus, it wasn't a fungus from Earth, said one of Mrs. Harris's neighbours. I bet my last dime it was some kind of spore from outer space. I just hope that it never comes back. If the blob was really a visitor from outer space, Texans in Aurora wouldn't be surprised. Aurora is a little town for 40 miles from Garland, and some people claim that they got interstellar tourists back in April 1897. According to Texas newspapers of the time, a cigar-shaped spaceship crashed into an Aurora windmill with a tremendous explosion. But that wasn't all. In the wreckage, they found what remained of the ship's pilot, a very small being who was obviously not an inhabitant of this world. I remember my parents telling how the flying ship exploded, recalled Mary Evans, and the pilot was torn up and killed. What was left of him was buried in the local graveyard. As time went on, the UFO and his pilot were more or less forgotten until a reporter named Bill Case happened to read the old newspaper reports. He worked for the Dallas Times Herald and was looking for a scoop. According to the old newspapers, the spaceship was broken into pieces of an unknown metal. If Case could find some of these pieces, he would then have a tremendous story. So he teamed up with professional treasure hunter Frank Kelly, and the two men went to Aurora. There they began digging around the site of the UFO crash, which was now a chicken coop at the back of a service station. Sure enough, their digging turned up pieces of metal that looked like nothing known on Earth. Kelly turned his metal detector on the metal and it gave off strange signals. Kelly and Case took the detector to the Aurora graveyard and after aiming it at the grave of the UFO pilot, the machine returned the exact same strange signals. Samples of the metal had been sent to North Texas University where physicist Dr. Tom Gray was examining them. He admitted that the metal fragments were, quote, very interesting, but would not say whether or not they would come from another world. One of the metal chips is mostly iron with 25% zinc, said Gray. Now that wouldn't be unusual if this was stainless steel, but it isn't. I don't know what it is. Gray says that another bit of metal is more suspicious, for it has zinc and American threads machined in it. Who knows what a spaceship is made of? He said, but I don't think a spaceship would carry American threaded zinc. We've got a lot more testing to do on this one. It arouses my curiosity. Senior citizen Charlie Stevens of Aurora is certain that the metal is not of this earth. That he was there when a strange ship crashed into the windmill. Just as sure as I'm alive, he said. Something whizzed out of the sky and smashed into Judge Proctor's windmill. In 1897, as Mr. Stevens pointed out, 
There were no known earthly pilot carrying power driven heavier than air flying objects. And that is the end of chapter 2, The Yellow Blob of Texas. Now, I will end this video, but not before saying that I will definitely have the next part out on the 4th, no matter what. I'm actually hoping that this new series is going to be popular, or at the very least gain a bit more attention. For it is October of all months where people tend to read a lot of creepy pastas on their YouTube channels. And, well, I thought if I actually read old books instead of creepy pastas, that might be breaking the mould a little bit. Something a bit more interesting. But the thing about creepy pastas is that you definitely know they're supposed to be fake. But with old books like these, which reportedly claim that they're real, well, you really can't tell, or if you can't. I mean, there has been evidence of people having supposed psychic links to one another. Like Dave Greenberg and Bob Harns. And there have been reports of strange funguses that nobody has ever seen before. Like the Yellow Blob of Texas. Make up your own mind and let me know in the comments what you think is going on. But until then... I am Necro Arcanist X Triple I, signing off. Good night, YouTube. Stay classy.